On a hill far away Stood an old rocket cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for who hurled of lost sinners was slain, and I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my troll. And they'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will I got here this morning and uh, I looked at the bulletin that Doris had done and front of the bulletin went right along with what I'm going to be preaching on this morning. And this is not what I would planned on preaching. It's not what I gave uh, Kelly last week. So she's had to do some quick changing this morning. Turn to Matthew 28, if you would. Matthew 28. Verses 16 through 20. And the message this morning is all the church has is Jesus. And church, all we need is Jesus. Look with me in Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Listen, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Father, we ask that you bless the reading of your precious word this morning. Father, help us to realize that uh, the main thing is Jesus. And we need to keep our focus on Jesus, as Cynthia talked about this morning. And Father, we need to be making disciples, telling people about Jesus, helping people to grow in their relationship with Jesus. We've just had a great week of Vacation Bible School. We saw some souls saved. 
we saw some people get excited about what God was doing in their life, in this church, and how God was using them. And I pray now, Father, that excitement would grow and become contagious. And our church would just be filled with excitement and enthusiasm about serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing us one more opportunity to gather in your midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to share with you, it's a true story, and uh, you've probably heard it before, but there was a large, beautiful church in a, in a big town. This church building was four stories tall, very ornate, marble. I mean, it was a beautiful church building. And this church building took up a whole city block. And everybody in this town knew about this church. They knew about this church because of how beautiful it was. They knew about this church because they had a preacher that was educated and dignified. They had a choir that could just sing uh, as well as anybody could possibly sing. And they had a congregation that was made up of very wealthy people, very well-to-do people, important people. In the foyer of the church was this huge marble statue over 10 foot tall. It was a marble statue of Jesus with his arms outstretched. It was an impressive building, but it was dying, slowly dying, because they weren't bringing people to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of their life. This was a church that thought, well, people will come to us. They'll come to us because we've got this beautiful building. We've got this impressive building. Well, people will come to us because of our preacher and our, and our choir and, and the people that are a member of our church. But people weren't coming and the church was dying. One night that church caught on fire. The whole building went up in flames. And in the floor, in the foyer where the statue was, when the floor burned, the statue fell down into the basement. The next day, the firemen were putting out the last of the flames and, and dousing the smoke, and they began to clean up and, and look for any valuables that might not have been destroyed. And there in the basement of that church, they found that statue of Jesus with his arms outstretched. And it hardly had a mark on it. Wasn't even hurt. So they got this crane and they come and they lifted this statue out of the basement and set it on the sidewalk and the workers and the firemen were standing there and one of the firemen looked at that building. Nothing left of the building. Then he turned around and looked at that statue sitting on the sidewalk. And he said, looks like Jesus is all that church has got left. Folks, you remember what the Apostle Paul said about the church and about the foundation that we need to build our church on? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. Folks, that church was a big, impressive church building, but nothing survived that fire except the statue of Jesus. The congregation didn't have a building left to worship in. The preacher didn't have a place that he could stand up and, and preach his sermons. The choir had no place to sing. And, and, and the people had no place to come and, and, and show how wealthy and how important they were. All they had left was Jesus. Folks, listen, the Bible is very, very clear. We need to hear this. The Bible is very, very clear that all the church should ever need is Jesus. That's all we need. And when Jesus and his disciples were, were meeting, uh, for that final meeting in, 
Jesus gathered them all together. In verses 18 and 20, it says, He spake unto them and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Folks, the church was established by the authority of Jesus. This church and every church that is a real church exists for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason we're here. That's the reason we teach Sunday school, teach the Word of God, and have vacation Bible school, and all the ministries and the programs that we have is because of Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, 17, and 18 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. For he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, listen, he might have preeminence. Folks, you know what that means? In all things, he's supposed to be number one. We're supposed to put him in front of everything. Folks, the church exists for Jesus. That's the only reason we exist. In fact, a healthy church will build itself around Jesus. A healthy church will build its ministries and its programs around Jesus. Folks, a church never ought to build around a preacher or a building or a program or a ministry. It needs to be built around Jesus and Jesus alone. I, did a, I found a study that I get in a Facts and Trends magazine. And it, this came out not long ago, and it, they did a study of what they called healthy churches. And these healthy churches were churches that were growing. These were churches that were having a, an impact on their community for Jesus. And Lifeway found that in all of these churches, there were 12 characteristics that were found in every one of these churches. Now, I'm not going to list all 12 of them, but there were four of these characteristics that really caught my attention. Number one was, a healthy church will always have a high regard for the Word of God. Healthy churches will have leaders and members who believe in the Bible, and I'm talking about the whole Bible from beginning to end. A healthy church is a church that believes what the Bible means and means what it says. Folks, if God said it, we need to believe it. I, I had an evangelist that come to preach one time at a church where I was, and he had a habit of saying, now this is what God said, but this is what God means. Folks, if God said it, God means it. We don't need to change it. In a healthy church, the members of the church, a large number of the members of the church will read the Bible every day and study the Bible. They not only hold the Bible up high and have a high regard for the Bible, they read the Bible, study the Bible. Healthy congregations will encourage each other to study and to read God's Word. That's the reason we have Sunday school, to learn more about God's Word. That's the reason we're encouraged to read the Bible through every single year. And a healthy church will have a priority and a focus on giving to missions. Whether it be Lottie Moon or Annie Armstrong or the Golden State or Mother's Day or whatever we give, we not only give to missions, we support missions and want to be a part of missions. But the fourth thing, this is what really caught my attention because been talking about this the last two or three Sundays and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Healthy churches are evangelistic. 
the gospel is not only central in a healthy church, but we tell people about Jesus. We tell people about his love. And when we do that, it helps to change people's life. Look at what he did during Vacation Bible School this week, the 12th so. So what does those four characteristics tell us this morning? It tells us that if we're going to be a healthy, growing church, we need to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. We need to read the Bible so we'll know how to do what Jesus wants us to do. And especially, we need to be doing what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We need to be going out and teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Jesus said, my highest priority is for people to know how much I love them and to know, let people know that I died for them so that they can have eternal life. Folks, if it's high, his highest priority, shouldn't it be our highest priority? Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Isn't that what the church should be doing? But you say, well, how do you go about making disciples? How do you go about telling people about Jesus? First of all, we need to start with the belief that making disciples and telling people about Jesus is something that we need to be doing. You know, there are church people who think that making disciples is something that somebody else ought to be doing, but not them. A healthy Christian takes every command of the Bible personally, especially that command that says that we need to go out and seek and save the lost. Folks, if it's his priority, shouldn't it be our priority? If that's what he came to do, shouldn't that what the, be what the church exists to do? But some Christians believe that bringing people to Jesus is the preacher's job. I've heard it several times. You talk about visitation, you talk about soul winning, you talk about teaching a soul winning class, <coughs> and without fail, there'll be somebody come to me and say, that's what we pay you to do. That's in your job description. Folks, that's part of my job description, but listen, it's part of your job description too. Read the Bible. Do you know where sheep come from? Do you know how we get sheep? What makes sheep? Sheep come from sheep. And the more sheep that make sheep, the bigger the flock. Jesus is our good shepherd. We're his people. We're the sheep of his pastor. And the good shepherd wants his flock to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But if only a few sheep are making sheep, then the flock's not going to grow the way God wants it to grow. And the good shepherd's going to be disappointed. There's an old song we used to sing down at New Midway a long time ago. I was there in 1979, I guess. And it was an old song then. But it goes something like this, and I probably don't remember it just the way it goes. But it said, I wonder what kind of church my church would be if every member was just like me. How many souls would be saved if it all depended upon me? How many prayers would be prayed if all the prayers that he heard came from me. I wonder what kind of church my church would be if every member was just like me. You know, too often Christians think that all they have to do is give a little, serve a little. They put a little time in at church. They sing a little when they come to church. They pray a little when they come to church. They put a little in the offering plate and they say, that's all Jesus expects from me, just a little. Folks, is that really all you want to do for Jesus? Just a little? 
just give him a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Now, I'm not wanting to make anybody feel guilty this morning, but I'm just wanting everybody to understand this morning that we are all part of the flock. We've got the same shepherd today. You're one of the rest of us sheep in this flock called Highland Park Baptist Church. And part of our objective of sheep in this church is to give Jesus what he expects from us. And all of us working together. You know, it always amazes me how God works. Last Sunday, uh, Charles Foshi and his wife Michelle come to join the church. After church, I was talking to them. Now, Tom's been wanting a trumpet player in the band. Tom, you've been praying for a trumpet player in the band? Must have been praying real hard. Where is Tom? He's up there. But after church, I asked. I asked Tom and Michelle, I said, y'all sing? Tom said, I used to be a music director, band director. He said, I can play any instrument you have to blow on. I can play a trumpet, a clarinet, a flute, a piano. He said, my wife is an accomplished singer. That's how God works. God always sends us folks that we need. People to work in Bible school, people to work in Sunday school, people to work in labor of love. Charles told me, he said, I've worked in the bus ministry for years. Been praying for people to help in the bus ministry. Folks, we're all part of the flock. And all we need to do is be telling people about Jesus, introducing people to Jesus. And it's a simple process. I don't know why people make it so hard to tell people about Jesus. All you got to do is introduce them to Jesus. You remember Jesus met the woman at the well? How many husbands that she had? Five. And she wasn't even married to the man she was living with at that time. But she was introduced to Jesus. She met Jesus. And you know what she did when she met Jesus? She ran back into town just as fast as she could run to town, and she told everybody she met about Jesus. Verse 29 says, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? And you know what happened? The whole town come out to see Jesus. Folks, this woman's reputation was totally trash. She was the town tramp. And yet she was able to convince people to come and see Jesus. And folks, if she could do it, you and I can do it. You know, it's all about one basic principle, bringing people to Jesus. We've got a bus ministry this week during, during church, uh, vacation Bible school. We had to run the van. We had to run the bus. Sometimes we had to run them, go back and pick up more. We've got children's ministries. We've got youth ministries. We've got the labor of love. We've got Sunday morning breakfast and Saturday morning breakfast. And I could go on and on and on of all the ministries and the programs. And there are people who are actively working at making sheep for Jesus. And folks, that's the main thing. How many people that are here today believe that God wants you to talk to somebody about Jesus? Raise your hand. Okay, you know God wants you to do it. So why not ask him for help in finding the right person and the right time to talk to somebody about Jesus? And he'll help you. James chapter 1, verse number 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto you. Ask, and you shall receive. You want to be a witness? You tell God, I want to be a witness? God will send you to somebody. Now let me ask you this. Suppose you go out and talk to somebody. And you're talking to them about Jesus, and they say, you know, I'd like to become a Christian. What would you tell them? 
Have you ever heard of the five finger exercise? Anybody ever heard of the five finger exercise? It's a new witnessing tool that's out. I want you to hold up your index finger. And I want you to say the word believe. Believe. The first thing you need to tell somebody that wants to be a Christian is that they need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Son of the living God. Now hold up two fingers. And I want you to say repent. Believe, repent. Repentance is where they accept the fact that they've sinned and they don't live that way anymore. Repentance means to turn away from their sins, turn away from their past. Now hold up three fingers. Say confess. Believe, repent, confess. They have to confess that they want Jesus to be their Lord they want Jesus to own them and to be the master of their lives. Now hold up four fingers. Baptism. After you ask Jesus to come into your heart, you're baptized. That's where you sign on the dotted line. That's where people know that you're serious. That's where they allow their past to be buried in that watery grave. And they come up that new person. Doesn't have anything to do with their salvation. But it lets the world know that they've been saved. Now hold up all five fingers. Live for Jesus. That's what that thumb's all about. Need to commit their lives to building their lives around Jesus. Not just going to church, but living their lives so that other people will know who it is that lives in their heart that they love. Folks, that's a five-finger exercise that everybody can do. Church, we've got a nice building. We've got as nice a building as anybody in town. We've got deacon's ministry. We've got labor of love. We've got all these things going on in the church, but none of these things mean nothing if we don't use them to bring people to Jesus. He's the reason we exist. He's all we have. Is he all you have? Are you sharing Jesus? We're going to be starting some new programs. And folks, we're going to follow through with them. We're going to start a witnessing program. We've been talking about evangelism explosion. We're not going to do evangelism explosion. We're going to do a thing called share Jesus without fear. Let me tell you why we're going to do this. Evangelism explosion would cost over $40 a person to buy your material per person. <clears throat> Takes 17 weeks to do it. There's a lot of memorization with it. This is five weeks. There's no memory. You get a New Testament, and you go through this, and you mark your testament as you study. And each week you go out and visit. And you just take that New Testament, take it out, open it up, and you don't even have to read it. You can let them read it. This is, this is going to be awesome. We're going to go out and tell people about Jesus. We're not just going to learn how to do it. Folks, we're going to do it. And the second thing we're going to do is we're going to spend more time as a church praying together. We're going to set aside a time to do nothing but pray. Now, W.T. and Ralph have had a burden about this, and they're willing to lead us in this. So we're going to tell them to go with it. We're going to do more programs for our children and our young people. We had over 200 young people here, children here, over 40 uh, young people, youth, here. They're excited. We need to keep them active. We need to have things for them even when school's out. Folks, the Lord never takes a vacation. We need to have something for them Sunday night and Wednesday night. Doesn't do any good to have ministries and program if you're not willing to get involved. It's not just enough to say we want to do this. You need to be a part of what we're doing. And I want to challenge every organization, every committee, every Sunday school teacher, 
to think of ways that we as a church could get more involved in taking the love of Jesus and the name of Jesus out in our community. Folks, all we need is Jesus as a church. All the world needs is Jesus. And let me ask you something. We say all we need is Jesus. We say all we have is Jesus. But do the ro those people around us know we have Jesus? How are they going to know unless they hear and they see God's love and God's power? And we're, folks, do you know how you spell evangelism? Do you know how you spell witnessing? W-O-R-E. Okay. And that scares a lot of people to death. But folks, listen. We're doing the work of Jesus. And we need to give him our time and our talents and our abilities. There's so much we could do through the labor of love. There's so much we could do through our youth and our children and the bus ministry and other activities that we got going on. There's so much we could be doing to let the world know we've got Jesus and we want to share Jesus with a lost and dying world. Father, I ask that you bless us now as we go in to our time of invitation. Father, there were some that were saved in vacation Bible school this past week and they need to come and share with their church family that they made that decision. There are others who need to come and unite with our church on the promise of baptism or coming from another church. But they need to come and, and just put their life in this church. Say, this is where God wants me to be, where God wants me to serve. I pray you'd come this morning. I pray for those who need to ask Jesus to come into their heart this morning. Father, my prayer this morning is that we as a church family would make a commitment to you to use our talents, to use our gifts, to use our time, to use all that God has blessed us with to bring people into the flock. We as sheep need to go out and make more sheep. And we need to let the Lord know we're serious about doing what he wants us to do as a church. And I just pray we see our church family gather in the altar this morning. Say, Lord, I want to be involved and you want me to be what you want me to be. I want to tell people about Jesus. You might want to admit that you have a little bit of fear. You might want to admit your weaknesses to him, but then ask him give you strength in your weaknesses to be used as a witness for him. Father, bless our church. We saw our church come together this past week in a wonderful, wonderful way. How good it was to see our church laughing and loving and serving. And Lord, I've said many, many times the best is yet to come. And I still believe that with all my heart. It's going to take all God's family working together as one to accomplish His will and His purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing. If you need to come this morning, come. With us.